It is a new time. It's a new season. And I'm so excited. We just finished our Wake Up Conference 2023. And today we have a special presentation as you get to hear my message from the conference. This is so fun for me. Um, We are starting the advanced tour of my book, Jesus in Politics, One Woman's Walk with God in a Mudslinging Profession. Man, I poured out my heart in this book. I will have to tell you, it was a vulnerable process to get this book to a publisher and to print. And I'm so thankful for Charisma Media, Frontline Books, publishing this book. Um, You can get the book at our website. Um, An autographed copy is all we have available right now, but an autographed copy for $50 at our Christians Engage website. And you can also pre-order it on Amazon, Walmart, Books a Million, um, wherever you get your books um, for 20 bucks on those sites. Uh, It comes out nationally February 6th, but we have some a limited supply of advanced copies right now if you want to grab some of those for Christmas presents coming up. Autograph copy, and you can tell us who you want me to write it to for Christmas presents. Um, but I'm excited to share some of the stories in the book that I've never shared publicly before. I believe this message about how to walk in intimacy with Jesus um, in politics, government, in a hostile culture will really help all of us um, to walk with God in a more uh, distinct way, talking to Him in prayer hearing from him for the people around us. For me, it just happened to be elected officials and members of Congress. Um, And also walking out, how do we engage our heart? How do we make sure our heart is in a place of purity without offenses? And how do we love people regardless of even partisan labels behind their names? This book, I believe, is really going to impact hearts and minds throughout the political movements of America. Um, So grab Jesus in politics today and check out this message from the Wake Up Conference 2023. I'm so thankful to share it with you. Welcome to the Conversations with Christians Engaged podcast. I'm your host, Bunny Pounds, the president of Christians Engaged. This ministry exists to awaken, motivate, educate, and empower ordinary believers in Jesus Christ to do three things. To pray for our elected officials and our nation regularly to vote in every election to impact our culture, and to engage in some form of civic education or involvement for the well-being of our nation. I'm so thankful, Bunny, for what you do. A lot of people talk the talk, but you really walk the walk. I love it, love it. Love teaming up with you, Bunny. So excited about what you're doing and the people you're reaching. And And I will stand and lock arms with this woman of God, Bunny Pounds, any day of the week. Bunny, you are a new hero of mine. America is worth it. Now is the time. America needs your involvement. Please take our pledge to pray, vote, and engage. Join with a movement of other Christians that are doing these three simple things that can really impact this nation. Join us. Y'all are too sweet. Well, thanks for coming to our awesome party tonight. Have we had a party or what? I think we've dealt with all of uh, America and Israel's uh, problems tonight, but I hope to leave you with a whole bunch of hope. Um, I am so thankful for you guys being here. What an incredible time. This is our third year of the Christians Engage Wake Up Conference. Can you believe that? Was anybody here the first year we did this? Yes. All right. Second year. Anybody? Yes. All right. We got some repeat offenders. Um, I want to thank all of our sponsors that made this weekend happen. If you're a sponsor, if you're one of our friend sponsors, or you're just one that just came and generously gave towards this weekend, would you please stand right now? We want to honor you. Thank you. Please stand up. We wouldn't be here without uh, generous people that gave towards this event, and we believe that this weekend's going to change your life. That's what we believe. And so thank you so much, sponsors. We have so many elected officials in the room, from a member of Congress to state representatives to county officials. If you serve an elected office, whether you're school board, city council, uh, would you please stand? Would you please stand? Give these guys a hand. 
judges, justice of the peace, all serving everywhere. And I wanted to say, if you are active in the political movements, if you're a precinct chair, if you work as a staffer, um, if you're behind the scenes in a lot of places um, and you're active in a role, a leadership role within government or politics, would you please stand? Will you please stand? <laughs> Woo! Awesome. Well, we're here with Christians Engaged to minister to all Americans. We believe that God has a call on believers' lives to get outside the walls of the church. Does anybody believe that in this room? We believe it's time for the church to be activated and the best way to bring the gospel is to actually go into our chamber of commerce or go into our school board meeting or actually interact with people. You know, we got to get outside of our houses. And so the message tonight I want to bring as we close out this incredible evening with some of my amazing heroes, Kelly Shackelford. I can't believe he's on my national advisory board. And I can't believe Michelle Bachman did the afterword for my book. I'm still in shock about that. Um, but we want to... I want to talk to two groups of people tonight. I want to talk to people in this room or that hear this recording later on, that you're feeling a stirring, a burden from the Lord that, man, I've got to do something for my nation right now. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it looks like, but I'm feeling a burden and I have to respond to God in that. I also want to talk to some of you that are active in the political movements, that have been out there on the front lines for so many years. And um, this message is for both of these groups. And really this ministry is for both of these groups. You saw the video of us going to Washington DC. We thought we were going to educate Christians on prayer, voting, and engagement, and it turned into a ministry trip to elected officials. This is what happens around Christians Engage. But I want to submit to you that we have a mandate as the church. And when I say the church, I'm talking about Protestants, Catholics, whoever names the name of the Lord. I want to submit to you that we have a mandate to lift up a standard in this hour. To lift up a standard and to stand boldly as intercessors in what sometimes feels, as Kelly said so, you know, graphically, feels like a hostile culture many times. But we have a mandate in this church, in the American America that we live in, in this generation, to raise up a standard. I wanna start with a scripture that I spent a lot of time in during 2020. It's Isaiah 59. Isaiah 59, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save nor his ear heavy that it can't hear. For your iniquities have separated you from God, your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear, for your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perversity. Sounds a little bit about some of the culture that we're living in today. Isaiah 59 goes on in verse 15 through 16, and I encourage you to read this entire chapter. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness, it sustained him. Going on to verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Does anybody have some spirit of God inside of you? This standard, when there was no justice, was the son of God. Jesus laid down a holy life, and he became the standard. He lifted up the standard against wickedness. Jesus put himself in as the intercessor to lift up a standard for the purpose of redemption, our redemption. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, we have blessed hope. And the only answer 
for America is that blessed hope, the power of the gospel. When there was no justice, Jesus was justice. When there was no righteousness, Jesus was righteousness. When there was no salvation, Jesus was salvation. That's his name, Yeshua. When there was no intercessor, Jesus was intercession for the people that he loved. If you go around the streets of America right now and you pull out your Bible and you read people, this beautiful scripture, Romans 5, 18, you will find, as I've done with my friends at Time to Revive who are here this weekend, they don't know this scripture. They don't know the truth that's in us that God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. They don't know it, friends. I challenge you to go outside the walls of the church and spend time with people and see what God does when you simply talk about him in your community. In the same way, just as Jesus laid down his life to lift up a standard in his generation, we are called to lift up a standard. In the same way, we're called to be intercessors in this nation, in our generation, to carry the love of God and the presence of God everywhere we go. First John 4 says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love of God that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. Can you say that with me? So are we in the world. Look at yourself and go, you know what? That's me. I'm supposed to be as Christ in the world. The simple gospel is this. It's really not that complicated. We like to complicate everything in the American church. The simple gospel is Matthew 22. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your, all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is likened to this. This, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Is that really that difficult? Now, it is difficult in our flesh. <laughs> it is difficult to believe that we can love God with all our soul, mind, strength, our energies, our will. It's hard to love people. Has anybody been out in their community lately? Some of you elected officials are like, man, I don't know. It's hard to love people. But how do we love God and how do we love one another in the context of a nation? That's what I wanna to submit to you. When I lost my race for Congress in 2018, the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm waking up my church. Now it is high time for us to awake out of sleep. And he led me to three words. It was about 25 pages of notes, which was the beginning of Christians Engage in 2019. And it was the words that I really believe that the American church needs to grab a hold of and that we can all unify around. As James Robinson said, John 17, we can all get around this. Every church in America should be able to talk about these three words without splitting their church. Believe me, me and Ben Klein spend a lot of time talking to pastors, convincing them that they can talk about these three words without splitting their church. The three words are this, pray, vote, and engage. Pray, vote, and engage. We should pray for all men. We should pray specifically for our kings and all who are in authority. First Timothy 2, 1 through 5, one of my favorite scriptures. If you don't have this memorized, you should memorize it. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, of all the supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men 
to come to the knowledge, all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is but one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, I selfishly pray for my kings and my elected officials. Why? Because I want to lead a quiet and peaceful life. Does anybody else want to live a quiet and peaceful life? Does anybody else want to live, not live in North Korea or Venezuela or Cuba? Anybody? We have a responsibility to pray for our elected officials. And believe me, having walked with them for 16 years, they need your prayers. They need your prayers, friends. And that means praying for people regardless of political parties regardless of whether they have an R or a D beside their name, regardless of whether they're your chosen candidate that got elected. And we're also praying for us to live in freedom so that all men would be saved and so that we could please God. We please God. We vote. We love our neighbors by using our liberties to elect righteous leaders. Proverbs 29.2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, but when a wicked man rules, the people groan. This is truth. It's not that people are more perfect than other people. It's have they received the wisdom that comes from the holy book, the whole counsel of God in the word of God. That is the question. And we have a responsibility, friends, to show up at the ballot box and to pray and discern our ballot and ask God for wisdom. We're not gonna get it all right every time, but we have a responsibility to choose between imperfect people because Jesus is not on the ballot. I wanna remind you that, he's not on the ballot. So we have to make a choice between people that are not perfect for righteousness sake. There's no difference in national statistics between the general public and the people that call themselves born again Christians. Very, very, very little difference. And as you know, when you get down to primaries, only eight to 12% of registered voters are voting in primaries. Only one to 5% are voting in city elections. We have a problem, church. One church could take an election if we stood up in our city and ran righteous people for leaders. We engage, we go outside the walls of the church, standing in the gap and being salt and light. I'm not gonna read you the salt and light scriptures because you all know it. But I am gonna read you Ezekiel 22:30, which says, so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But I found no one. This is a different way of saying lift up a standard Let's stand in the gap. We have a responsibility to take the faith that we've been so graciously given, the power of the gospel, and to let the Spirit of God go with us wherever we go, into the halls of Congress or into our local communities. We have a responsibility to carry Jesus wherever we go. Can God use us within the political movements and within our civic organizations? If we walk with him. Yes. But we must walk with Jesus. And that's the second part of my message. <laughs> and that's really what this book is all about. And thank you guys for coming out to my advanced soft launch of Jesus and politics. This book doesn't come out till February 6th. We pushed it. Our publisher pushed it, but we got some copies. And I hope you guys dig into this story. I didn't think that I had much to write until I sat down to write it. <laughs> and then I realized, you know what? I have a lot of things to say to people that are engaged in politics and government, but also to call the church to a place of awakening and leadership in this space. My, my father, you're gonna see some pictures of my father here, and my family's here. I'm so thankful for my husband, Tim, and my sister, Sonny's here, and my brother-in-law, and my mom, and my stepfather. Um, baby Grayson, if you got to see baby Grayson for a minute. Uh, we're gonna have another baby here any day now, so one of our families away. But my father, you know, 
he really struggled when I started getting involved with politics and government. Um, you know, I could tell he kept, you know, having these conversations with me. Do you really think this is what you should be getting involved with? You know, he really believed there was something inherently evil or, you know, mudslinging about politics. And he was really concerned. He knew I had a call of God on my life to teach the Bible. And he was really concerned. You know, I don't know about this thing that you're doing. I don't know. You know, um, when he was on his deathbed a few years ago, he had a glioblastoma, brain cancer. And I got to spend a whole week with him uh, before he, he died. And I shared a lot of my stories that I share in this book. And it's like he got it. It's like finally, after years and years, he finally caught a glimpse that I was walking beside elected officials and members of Congress, and I was a part of their life, discipling them in the word, uh, giving them the word of God, praying over them when they needed it, right? He, he finally got it, and he goes, I think you're right where you're supposed to be. I wish my dad had um, seen me start a 32 client firm and help Christian conservatives all over Texas. I wish my dad had seen me run for Congress and almost win a race. I wish my dad had seen the start of Christians Engaged. I wish he'd seen Vice President Mike Pence go out on Twitter, endorse me, and make me the only person in the 2018 primary that he endorsed. I wish he'd seen some of our victories and our victory against the IRS and the beginning of this ministry, but he didn't get to see that, but he's in the cloud of witnesses cheering me on. But I've had so many opportunities um, to speak into the lives of elected officials, and I'm just a simple woman. <laughs> um, it's not that complicated to be able to be in people's lives and love them. And that's what I want to call you to. Can God speak to politicians? Oh, there's some politicians in the room, so yes, God can speak to politicians. Um, one of the highlights of my life um, was after my race for Congress, I lost a race and I had to go back to work. I didn't want to go back to work. And a, a friend by the name of Ron Wright called. And Ron was running for Congress in Arlington, Texas. You just met his beautiful uh, widow, Susan Wright, on the stage a few minutes ago. Ron was running for Congress and he had spent all of his money winning his runoff. He didn't have very much money left and I think he had like $20,000 in the bank and he called me and said, Bunny, I hate raising money. Can you help me? And I said, sure, Ron. And I just, I needed another cause to throw my heart into. So I started driving to Arlington and sitting beside him as he made calls. That was one of the pictures of him making calls. <laughs> when, believe me, he didn't want to do it. Um, about two months or a month and a half after I started with Ron, we, he got pulled into the hospital that he thought he had some kidney issues. And, uh, and they found a tumor in his lungs and spots on his liver. And he had stage four cancer. We were in the middle of a general election. He had a really, really tough general election. It was a, a district that was getting more and more competitive um, much money was going to be spent on it, and I'll never forget just that reality hitting me as myself and Micah, his campaign manager, and Susan were the only ones on the planet that knew that Ron had stage four cancer, and we had to get him through this election. And every day I would pray Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction. I would pray that over Ron, and I texted to him and Susan, I'm just like, we are going to believe for sustained life. Ron Wright is supposed to go to Congress. And he did go to Congress. He won that race. <laughs> and I remember distinctly having a phone call with Ron that night, the night before the election, going, you know, Ron, it's only been a few months since I lost my race for Congress, but I will say this. I think I might have lost to be able to have the privilege to walk beside you during this time. It was truly an honor and a privilege to walk beside him and Susan in that moment, and we became fast friends through that season. Uh, a year later, he told the world that he was in remission, and he ran for re-election again. 
um, as he's approaching re-election, the cancer came back. And uh, after he won re-election, a month or so later in, in January, he got COVID. Susan and him both got COVID. And on February 7th, 2021, our friend Ron Wright went to see Jesus. He was the first member of Congress to die of COVID. And I just wanted to memorialize Ron tonight because he was a great man of God. He was a great man of God. <laughs> Many of y'all know I walked for 10 years with Congressman Jeb Henserling. He was my first boss, uh, spent 10 years running his campaign all over East Texas. I ended up running for his congressional seat. But I'll never forget, we were on a Southwest Airlines flight in 2012. We were going down to San Antonio for a fundraiser and he was conference chairman, which means he was the fourth in leadership in the U.S. House. Uh, speaker Boehner was at the um, leadership table. He was the speaker. And Jeb, frankly, was the only real conservative at the leadership table. And they would have these meetings every couple days and he would tell them what he thought and then he would go outside in the press and he would support the speaker. And that kind of what you do when you're a staffer is you're real quiet in those moments. You try to let the member of Congress spend time with their notes and all these things. And then, you know, you speak when you've been spoken to. And he addressed me and said, he just started pouring out his heart to me that day on that plane. And he goes, I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I'm pretty miserable right now. I don't know if I'm going to run for leadership again, if I'm just going to scale back. I'm not really sure. And I, I had my Bible open because I was, you know, it was like an early morning flight, like 6 a.m. And I hadn't got my Bible reading then that day. And I opened up my Bible and I just got done reading Luke 12, 42. What says, the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. And I'll never forget that moment. I just was listening to his story for about 10 or 15 minutes. And I just turned to Congressman Henserling and I said, Sir, can I just submit something to you? I, I just read this scripture in Luke 12 and I read it to him. And I said, something in my heart tells me to tell you, stay faithful where you are. Stay faithful where you are, keep doing what you're doing, and eventually, really soon, you're gonna get your own field to take care of because God likes to reward faithful servants. That was um, just in, that, in the fall of 2012. November, election comes, and January comes leadership races, and all of a sudden, my boss got elected chairman of financial services. We never saw that coming. It wasn't in the plans, but all of a sudden for six years and three terms, he got to take care of his own field. Everything banking, insurance related in this country went through his committee and he dictated what happened in that committee. Francis Schaeffer, one of the Christian philosophers I loved when I was growing up, he said, no work of art is more important than the Christian's life. And every Christian is called to be an artist in this sense. The Christian's life is to be a thing of truth and also a thing of beauty in the midst of a lost and despairing world. Are we works of heart? Is that what we're pursuing in our life? I believe we are to become a work of art and we are to stay a work of art. But to stay a work of art as a Christian, specifically in government and politics, takes work. We have three enemies of our soul in politics that I like to identify, which is anger, pride, and fear. And these little enemies will come in and they will take over your life and they will take over it rapidly. So we have to combat these three enemies. And the way we do that, friends, is to obey quickly when God tells us something. When we know we're supposed to do something, we step out and we obey. I can't tell you how many times I have felt anger rising in my heart. I've felt, you know, pride hit my heart and I've had to make choices. Am I gonna respond? Am I gonna do something with this in my soul or I'm gonna allow it to take over my life? 
After my race for Congress, um, my friend, Congressman Lance Gooden, won that race. And it was devastating. You, you haven't lived till you've had $1.2 million spent against you and your family. <laughs> it was devastating. And like every person that has offenses, bitterness, and unforgiveness, I would check out his FUC reports every quarter and look and see who's giving him money, right? Because that's what you do when you hold offenses, bitterness, and unforgiveness. You keep tracking your people. And uh, I discovered uh, a couple months after our loss, it was May 22nd in Ju July 31st of that year, our FEC reports came out for that election. And I could see all of the things that were spent, everything that had happened. And uh, I discovered that he had not paid for the runoff. In essence, his consultants had not billed him for the runoff and they floated his invoices until after he won. $230,000 worth of invoices. Now, this is frustrating when you've paid all your bills and you outraised him, I outraised him, by $300,000. And the injustice of this, even though it's legal and they can do it, was hitting my heart. It hit my heart and I have never been more angry as I was in that moment <laughs> of the injustice of that. And I prayed, I took his Christmas card he sent that Christmas, him and his beautiful wife and their child. I took it to the prayer room and I prayed, God help me overcome, help me get rid of this anger and frustration, this offenses, bitterness and unforgiveness. And I couldn't get a breakthrough till a year later, uh, I had a conversation with somebody and they had told me that they had seen Congressman Gooden and I said something out of my heart. I just said this, you know what? I can't get over this thing. I think I need to do something drastic like throw him a party, celebrate him and help pay off his debt. <laughs> and right when I said that, tears started filling my eyes which is when I know it's God. And I thought that's exactly what I gotta do. And I would looked up his FEC report, and he had $50,000 left of his debt. So I called the congressman up and went out to lunch with him, and, and he asked me at the end of that meeting, he said, what can I do for you, Bunny? I said, well, frankly, sir, you can let me hold you a party and help you fundraise off of the rest of that debt. That's what I need to do. And he said, Bunny, I would be honored if you did that. So I took off a couple weeks of work without pay and we got to work and we had a huge party two weeks before we started Christians Engage and we paid off that debt. And there's some pictures of me and my friend, Congressman Lance Gooden, as we celebrated and all my team came together and we laid down our unforgiveness. The only way we persevere, the only way you make it in life and especially in government and politics or engagement, is you have to do crazy things of obedience to overcome the things that are in your soul or they will absolutely eat you. And I will say this, Congressman Lance Gooden was the first person to read my book and he was the first person to agree to his story being used in it. And I'm forever thankful for that. I wanna share one more story with you guys that I've never shared publicly until tonight. And it's a story that really means a lot to me that is in the book. But right after we won the case with the IRS, I was full time with Christians Engaged. And I'd been 16 years in political consulting as a Republican. And here I am moving into really full time for the first time, full time ministry, full time engaging people, loving people, activating the church regardless of political parties. And I would stand up on church platforms and I would say, we need to pray for all of our elected officials regardless of political party. And I would say it with boldness. I don't know if I believed it. I don't know if I really believed it. And in fall 2021, I had a dream. I had a dream and I don't dream. I'm not one of those people. Don't usually dream. Uh, but I had a dream that I was standing in front of Congressman Beto O'Rourke. And I was telling him that God loves him and he loves Amy, his wife, and he loves his kids. 
and he sees his servant heart towards people. And I apologized to him on behalf of the body of Christ in his congressional district that never prayed for him. Uh, now, okay, I don't really dream and I don't really remember dreams normally. And so that was a shock for me. And I woke up and I thought, whoa, what was that? I don't know what that was. <laughs> um, but I guess I need to pray for Congressman O'Rourke. I guess I need to deal with something in my soul. And uh, during the primary that year, he had just started a race for governor. Um, I was down with Kyle Martin, who you'll meet tomorrow. Kyle and his team was doing evangelism down in Laredo, Texas. And I was burned out on politics. And I'm like, you know what? I need to go share the gospel for a couple days. So I headed down to Laredo, Texas. And as I'm praying down, as I'm going to Laredo, I'm going, God, strip me of all prejudice every racial prejudice I have, every prejudice against illegal immigrants, any social economic prejudice, anything that would keep me from loving people and seeing them after the Spirit. Help me, God, as I go down to Laredo to be as Jesus in this place. Well, we went out and we shared the gospel and I led teams for a couple days. And um, one night, Kyle sits down to me at, right before dinner. We, we were at this church and he sits down to me and he goes, Bonnie, guess what? We got to, uh, I got to pray for the county judge today. And I thought, oh, that's awesome, Kyle. And my first thought was, is he a Democrat? And he said, yes, of course he's a Democrat. We live in, this is Laredo, Texas, Bunny. And, and I thought, yes. And he goes, he really knows God. He was really sensitive to the Lord. I said, well, that's awesome, Kyle, wonderful. And he goes, you will never believe what happened to me the other day. I met this guy in a grocery store and I shared the word of God with him. I shared the gospel with him. We had this encounter in a grocery store and he told me that he's leading the rally and the reception for Beto O'Rourke tonight in this city. And he wants me to come pray for Beto. And I was like, Kyle, absolutely. You should go pray for Beto, please. He needs prayer. <laughs> he needs prayer. And Kyle goes, no, I'm not supposed to go pray for Beto tonight. I've got to preach tonight. Somebody else might need to go. And he just looked at me. And when Kyle Lance Martin looks at you, you do whatever Kyle Lance Martin tells you to do. Though he didn't really know, he didn't know that I'd had a dream about Beto three months before. And again, I know when God's moving on something, I start tearing up. And I said, I gotta go. And he gave me the guy's number and I headed off to what turned out to be a Beto O'Rourke rally. So I want you to get the scene here and I know I'm belaboring this, but I want you to catch it. 16 years of political consulting. Running for Congress, being the only woman in 2018 that made it to Republican runoff ballot. And I'm walking into a Beto O'Rourke rally, <laughs> praying that the television cameras will not catch me. But you know what I did? I set my heart the moment I walked in. A good friend told me on the way there, Bunny, you're not going in as a Republican. You're going in as an agent of the kingdom. And I went in and I did exactly what I'd been doing for two days. I went around and started praying for people. How can I help you? How can I pray for you? I prayed for the district director for the member of Congress. I prayed for a state representative staffer. I just started praying for people and you would not believe how receptive they were to me praying for them. I had my Time to Revive evangelism t-shirt on and I was all in for Jesus. Well, at the end, I found the guy, and yes, I'd missed the private meeting that Kyle was supposed to pray over him, um, but I had sat there and listened to him speak, and as I sat there, the Lord told me to pull out my phone and write down everything that I agreed with Congressman O'Rourke on. I thought, that's going to be short. That's going to be a really short list, God. Well, there was three or four things I wrote down. And I found the man that Kyle had prayed for at the end, and he goes, oh, I'm so glad you're here. This encounter with Kyle Martin changed my life. I am so happy you're here. Okay, this is what's gonna happen. Beto's gonna um, take pictures, and he's gonna meet people all 
and in this line and he's gonna spend as much time as he wants with people and then I'm gonna introduce you. I'm gonna tell him why you're here and you're gonna pray for him and he's gonna be so blessed. I was like, okay, that's what we're gonna do. And so I just stood in line. I stood in line next to a Baptist Sunday school teacher who's a public school educator that teaches her Bible study at church and loves Jesus and loves Beto. And I ministered to her and I prayed the word over her. And all of a sudden I'm in front of Beto O'Rourke. I said, hi, I'm Bunny. I'm here with a ministry called Time to Revive. <laughs> I also lead a ministry called Christians Engaged. And we're here doing evangelism on the streets of Laredo. We've had 30 churches come together and we're sharing the gospel and we're hanging out with people, loving on them and praying for them. And, and, and this guy told, tells him everything that Kyle happened at the, at the grocery store. Like he gave me this amazing introduction, right? And I'm telling him this and I said, you know what happened was when Kyle asked me to come pray for you, he didn't know I had a dream about you three months ago. He's like, what, you had a dream about me? I said, yeah, it was crazy. I was dreaming about you and the Lord told me that he loves you and he loves your wife, Amy, and he loves your kids and he sees your servant heart towards people. And I'm telling you, as I'm sharing it, I'm living the dream. I'm in the dream, speaking right to his eyes, telling him exactly who he is. And then I said, Congressman, and he goes, wow, thanks for calling me congressman. Nobody's called me congressman in a while. I said, well, that was your last title. You should be called congressman. I said, congressman, I want to apologize for everybody that names the name of Christ that lived in your congressional district and never prayed for you. And right then I had tears started welling up in my eyes and he had tears welling up in his. I am telling you, I have never felt the presence of God like I did in this meeting. So then I continue. So the crazy thing about this is, I had a dream about you and he goes, I can't believe you had a dream about me, that is crazy. I said, the crazy thing is, is I'm a Republican. <laughs> I've been a consultant for 16 years. I ran for Congress, I almost won a seat for Congress. And he said, what's your name? And I said, Bunny Pounds and he was like, Oh, Bunny, we made fun of your name so much. He goes, what are you doing here? I said, I don't know. I just know that the Lord sent me. And what you need to know is I'm very close to the Cruz family. Raphael's like a father to me. I'm very close to his family. And I'm here, and I'm here to pray for you. And I said, knowing all that, would you allow me to pray for you? He goes, Bunny, I would be honored. And he held out his forearm to me and his assistants taking pictures and the presence of God showed up in a Beto O'Rourke rally. I'll tell you, it was one of the most meaningful moments of my life. And I got done with this quick two, three minute prayer, made it very unreligious, like I train everybody with Christians engaged. Got done praying. Um, and he said, Bunny, can I have your cell phone number? I was like, I don't know. That's kind of weird. He goes, no, I'm, I'm, seriously, I want your cell phone number and this is why. This has been one of the most meaningful meetings I've ever had. And I said, sure. And I gave him my cell phone and he texted me, this is Beto. I wandered out, I prayed for one of his staffers on the way out and I got in my car and I just bawled. I couldn't drive for like an hour because I realized how much I had not seen people the way Jesus sees them. Since that time, Beto and I have texted several times. When his, when his sister died last December, I sent him a, a whole article I wrote on Psalms 23 and he said, thank you so much, Bunny. He always gives me a thumbs up when I send him something encouraging. I don't know how deep this encounter went with Beto as far as did it change him, but I can tell you this, it changed me. Absolutely changed me. The same anointing that came over Jesus out of Isaiah 61 is the same that we're supposed to walk in. 
and it's this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in, in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Church, that is our call. Are you hearing me? That is our call. Can we walk with Jesus through our interactions with elected officials, chamber of commerce presidents, civic organizations, school boards, city councils, homeowners association, I submit to you that we have to and we must. For the well-being of our local communities, our state and our nation, we must become intercession lived out every day. What does America need in this moment of history? America needs you, America needs me. America needs our participate and involvement to pray, vote, and engage. And Christians engage. We will show you how. We've created a roadmap for Christians all over and now 150,000 Christians are in our system to activate them to vote in every election in all 50 states. But will we stand? And as we engage, will we remain Christ followers? Will we be ones that stand up with boldness and courage, but yet also operate within the Sermon of the Mount? That is the question. Many people say you can't do both. I submit to you, after almost 20 years in this space, we can do both. We can see people after the Spirit, we can love people, we can be peacemakers, but we can also stand up for biblical truth and biblical worldview. That is our calling. So as we close out tonight, and oh, by the way, tomorrow's gonna be amazing. Tomorrow's gonna be amazing. We're gonna hear from Congressman Michael Cloud and so many others. Um, if you want more worship, Klaus and his team will lead 30 minutes of extended worship tomorrow morning. So, and breakouts, those are awesome too. But I wanna submit to you tonight, some of you are feeling a burden from the Lord and you're in this room because you know God's calling you to do more, to step out in leadership and be like Nehemiah, standing on the walls, activating their community, doing something for the well-being of America. Some of you are feeling that call and this is your night to say yes to God for that. You might not have the, all the answers. You might not know what that looks like. Some of y'all are running for office. Some of you are stepping out and you need prayer and ministry. And then some of us that have been active and have gone through battles and trials and were, I believe God wants to heal our heart tonight. And I believe he wants to bring repentance in places where we've demonized other people, where we've carried offenses, bitterness, and unforgiveness, and let this stuff eat up our soul to the plate where we can't hear from God. I believe the call goes out to the, both of those groups of people, and I believe that encompasses almost everybody in this room. So as we close out tonight, um, I want my board of directors, and if you're an area leader with Christians Engage and you feel like you can come pray for people, I want you to come up to the front. If y'all would come up right now, board, area leaders, we're not gonna belabor this. But we're not gonna do a conference that doesn't include you getting prayer and you getting ministry if you want it. Because we're all in a battle. We are in absolute warfare most of the time. And if I've learned anything in 20 years of doing this is that I need prayer and ministry constantly to make it every day. If you're involved and you walk in your local church, half the time you feel like an orphan and a stranger. <laughs> At least I have. Can I say that we're here to minister to your heart, to run with you and to make sure that you're stirred up in what you're called to do. 
And so I'm going to open up the altars. If you want to come get prayer, you feeling a deeper call into to being a leader, have somebody agree with you, pray over you. If you're running for office right now, we would love to pray over you. We would love to just encourage your heart, uh, regardless of if your opponent's in the room here tonight. Um, I want to encourage you to step out, and then some of you just need to say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I've let some of this stuff take over my soul. This is not who I am. And I want to really walk in the Holy Spirit. I want to walk in the presence of God. And I don't want to be corrupted with the political spirit that will steal my life. I want to operate in who I'm called to be, but I want to be like Jesus. And I want to see people differently, even as I'm standing for truth. So Klaus is going to play here. I'm going to have Klaus come up. Um, if you guys will stand with me. <sighs> Thanks for letting me share my Beto story. <laughs> it's been fun to think about all that God's done in my life since that moment. Um, I believe that this story of my book is not just to create a book. I really believe that God has his hand on it. And I thank you guys, those of y'all who are sponsors or VIP tickets that already got a book tonight. Um, but I wanna encourage you to help me pre with pre-orders on this book. Um, if we can get on Christian TV and Christian radio all over this nation, um, we can reach a million Christians by the 2024 election. And this book is a critical part of that. Um, and so we've got a deal here at the conference where if you pre-order it on Amazon, christianbook.com, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, um, we, you can get another one for just 10 bucks. So you can wait till February, get the book, um, but also just get one for 10 bucks here today um, or any time in the weekend. You can get one for 20 bucks if you wanna pay the full price now and you can read it before everybody else in the country. Um, and I encourage you to read it and let God touch your life and to share it with other people. Because I believe that if we as Christ followers walk in prayer, voting, and engagement, and we do it in the spirit of Jesus, we can absolutely impact America. That's our goal with Christians Engage, and that's what we're calling you all to tonight. So I'm going to pray. If you would just bow your head with me. And again, the altars are going to be open if you want to come. Um, I'll be out signing books if anybody wants to get books afterwards. Lord, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for Kelly Shackelford. What an incredible hero of the faith. God, thank you for Michelle Bachman. Lord, thank you for this night and thank you for your presence. God, there's nothing we can do without your presence. We're completely dependent on you. And God, as we step out and we say yes to leadership in our communities, God, we admit that we need your presence. We need your spirit. We need you to walk with us. We can't do it alone. We can't do it on our flesh. We can't love you and love our neighbors without you enabling us to do it. And God, in the places where we have held bitterness and pride and anger and fear, and we've let those things corrupt our souls and our hearts, God, we pray that you would cleanse us tonight by your Holy Spirit. God, we repent. We repent and confess, Lord, that we have seen people not the way you see them, that we've seen them with an R or a D behind their name. We've seen them from different social economic situations, God. We've seen them whether they're legal or illegal. We have seen people not the way you see them. And God, we pray that you would change our hearts, God, that we would stand up for boldness and truth, that we would operate in a biblical worldview, but we would also operate in the heart of Jesus. That's who we're called to be. And so Lord, I thank you as we walk out of this church tonight, God, that we start a new journey of walking with you in pureness of heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey friends, thank you so much for joining me as I shared the message from our 2023 Wake Up Conference. What an incredible time we had together. I, this conference just humbles me every time we do it. Um, that as these people come together across denominational lines, 
across party lines and come together for the purpose of the kingdom of God. It's just really been an honor um, to put this conference on and check out um, all of our conference footage. There is a, a live link that you can get and you can watch all the videos for the conference and get my book, Jesus and Politics. Go ahead and pre-order it now on Amazon, uh, Books a Million, Barnes and Noble, Walmart, wherever you get your books. And if you want advanced autograph copies, check those out at christiansengage.org and we'll make them out for your kids, your grandkids or Christmas presents around the country. We love you guys so much and thank you so much. I cannot tell you how much Christians Engage has meant to us uh, this year for us to walk with you every day. Please consider uh, putting us in your year in giving plans. Um, This ministry would not be here without you. We love you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us for this incredible podcast. What in the time we've had. We love you so much. We love being in your life. Have you subscribed? Have you shared this with your family and friends? Please subscribe on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, Rumble, wherever you get your audio or video pods. We need your help. This mission is undergirded by individuals just like you that support this ministry monthly, annually and whenever you think about us to be able to reach over a million Christians in the next two years. That's our goal. We want to empower a million Christians around America to pray, vote, and engage regularly. Will you help us? We're here to do that and we need your help. I want to say thank you to our partners at The Stream. What an incredible online publication put out by James Robinson and Life Outreach International as we come together across denominational lines as believers to discern what God's saying about the news of the day and to hear from different viewpoints. Check out the stream, make it your homepage and get on their email list. This product is amazing. Also our partners at Edify app put out by Christian Post. This podcast app is a convergence of Bible teachers around America. We're excited to be a part of Edify app Check out all their other podcasts. Thank you so much again for caring about this nation. We're here to help you pray, vote, and engage. We'll see you next week.